in essence, we're all part of the same source. They're all part of the same volume of sentience. And therefore, we're all we're all one. I am you, you are me. We are all source. The, the person down the road is us. When we start to understand that, we, we won't start to be angry at each other or we won't start to you know, discriminate against each other. We'll start to realise that we're all one and the same thing. And that if we are discriminating against some somebody else who's in, or another soul that's incarnate, we're only affecting ourselves. So why, why would you beat yourself up? You wouldn't. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure to have Guy Needler with us. Guy initially trained as a mechanical engineer and quickly progressed on to be a chartered electrical and electronics engineer. However, throughout this earthly training, he was always aware of the greater reality being around him, catching glimpses of the worlds of spirit. Guy subsequently learned energy and vibrational therapy techniques from a direct student of the Barbara Brennan School of Healing, resulting in him becoming a fellow of the Complementary Medical Association. Along with his healing abilities, Guy is able to channel information from spirit, contacting other entities within our multiverse, his higher self, and guides which resulted in his first book, The History of God, and produced eight more published texts. Guy, it's so great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Stefan, for inviting me. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be able to work with other truth seekers and those who are broadcasting the truth to the um, to the world. So you're a, you're a key part of the team. <laughs> thank you, as are you. And I heard about you from, uh, I, I was watching a video and it was about backdrop people and backfill people. It was... Um, really impactful for me yeah that would have been with dolores years ago yeah it was dolores cannon you guys agreed on pretty much uh the whole concept of how that worked you just had different names for it she calls them or called them uh, backdrop people and you called them backfill people and i just that really resonated with me that that felt true and then i started noticing when it uh seemed like this was a backfill person uh versus not and it's a little dangerous to start uh, differentiating people so i try not to do that but it was uh it was a, like an, another step on the ladder towards really understanding the nature of reality so i'd love to maybe start this conversation talking about what your understanding of reality is and and how it works and this whole thing of the multiverse and timelines and uh, ascending and all that like maybe just lay it all out for our listener who may not be familiar <laughs> okay well to be honest there was a difference between backfill and backdrop people and uh, although it, originally dolores thought it was the same thing it actually isn't but they support each other which is interesting because one's a function of us creating our own reality around ourselves and therefore the backdrop of the scenery and the individuals that we expect to see and that others who support our reality also expect to see and the backfill people are basically another genre of soul that's being allowed to incarnate on the earth to allow the population of the earth to, to be sustained whilst those who are ascending beyond the gross physical i.e. the first three frequencies, into the next frequency, which is the fourth frequency, which is the lower of astral, uh, are allowed to do that without creating a mad panic about, you know, all of a sudden there's lots of people disappearing in the world. So they're a different genre. They're, they're, their sentience uh, or their quality of sentience is in between us, so to speak, and those that we classify as being the animals. And they haven't been given the chance to incarnate uh, in any location in the, in, the, in the physical universe with the level of individualized free will that we enjoy here. And so they, they get a little bit intoxicated with this. And, they, and, and they, although they're protected, they don't actually accrue karma. You would, you would not think so with the way they think, behave and act because they, they actually, they're a little bit like a child in a sweet shop. They, they don't just get one sweet, they want to go for the whole lot. And so they get um, confused sometimes and they get attracted to things like status, material, wealth, um, you know, wanting to to have everything and, and everything now rather than waiting for it. So they're different things, basically. 
backfill people are there to help the, the human souls evolve to the next level whilst still being incarnate or even during this incarnation whereas the backdrop people are simply a function of us creating our localized reality and in conjunction with those other entities who are creating similar or same realities and so forth they support a collective reality and so the back the backdrop people are not just part of my reality or your reality they're part of the collective group of individuals who are sustaining the reality around us so how does that differ or how is it the same from this concept of an npc or non-player character which comes from video games where they're just uh filling some space kind of like extras in the movie but they're they're not souls in our uh in in our soul family or anything the backfill souls basically they are they functioning like us they are they have their own identity they have their own personality they will evolve as a function of experiencing um individualized free will here even though they they get a bit um intoxicated so to speak whereas the the backdrop people are basically like if you imagine for instance you right now you've got a green screen if you imagine that when when the when, when the, the 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 viewers are going to watch this they're going to see what you've put behind on the green screen and that's basically what they are they're part of the green screen or if you were thinking about it in the old days of cinematography you had artists that painted the backdrop behind the actors if they were doing some of the scenes actually in uh, a studio rather than being outside and and also these entities that are there they're, they're basically almost like an animated painting in the back that's the, that's the best way to describe it um, because they 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 move around and they look as if they've got purpose but actually they haven't they are in effect they're they're, they're, they're extras in our play or our film and and they have no function other than other than being that so although we think that who is a back a backdrop person who is a backfill person well a backfill person they're usually quite immature in the in the way that they think behave and act even though they could be mature in age they would be not very expansive in their thought processes they could still be very very successful very yeah they could still be you yeah, know chief executive officers of a, of a, of a, of a company but that will be a function of their of their desire to be successful or their greed so to speak whereas the backdrop individuals you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to interact with them they would always be in the background you'd never be able to get to them or touch them or, or communicate with them because they're always just out of out of reach whereas the backfield people you can interact with them you can you can create dialogue you can, you can create friendships with them and, and a lot of people do um because they are they are sentience they're souls but it's not the same quality of sentience or the same genre therefore as what we are so, so, so there's a difference there so the one is clearly on the evolutionary cycle same as us whereas the other and, the, and they're new souls by the way in, in terms of the, the, their being ability to incarnate uh, with individualized free will because they've usually got collective will um whereas the yeah, the backdrop is just it's always in the background it's like the horizon line is always there but you never quite touch it so you never quite get to it it's always there yeah that reminds me of a scene from uh the truman show where he finally gets to the uh the horizon <laughs> he t he manages to get on a boat overcome his uh his fear of water and gets to the uh the edge of this dome that's painted to look like sky and uh scenery and everything and uh yeah it's uh it's all an illusion <laughs> absolutely it, but it's, it, it's 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 an illusion but it's not an illusion because we create it you know, we, we are although we, we're quite limited in what we can do here because our belief system is created as a function of our programming from when we are associated with the body with the body associated um and when we're born and we how we how we're taught by our parents how we interact with our, our siblings and our peers and our authority figures and our teachers teach us we're always taught that we are limited but in actual fact we're not limited at all it's just that being in a low frequency environment where we've got 
extremely limited communicative bandwidth with who and what we are, we don't have the the remembrance because we become body associated as a function of the gestation process and the connection of the soul to the body. And we only lose that when the body demises. We, we return back to the, to the energetic. So we collectively create this backdrop, the environment, you know, even where I am now, you know, if you look outside, there's houses out there. Um, we've collectively created this back, this, this, this backdrop and we, and we like it to be there. And it, and it is there because there's lots of other souls who also want it to be there. So that, that's, that's the creativity part of it. We want things to exist. And so it does exist. We don't realize that we're making it exist because we, we, we think it's already always been there and it has. But if you think about it, when you go on holiday, you go into another reality, don't you? Which is somebody else's reality. You know, if you go to Spain or you go to Portugal or Greece or, or any other location, we we in effect go into somebody else's reality and that becomes part of our reality so that which was previously our reality no longer exists for us but still exists for other people because they're perpetuating it and how does this relate to the multiverse well <laughs> the multiverse is a static structure in effect it's it's a it's a a part of the part of structured space which is occupied by sentience. Now, without going into the vast detail, we, we, we all part, we're all part of one sentience, and that sentience is called the source, we refer to it as God. And, we're, and our true energetic selves are individualized units of sentience from that larger volume of sentience that is tasked to experience and therefore learn and evolve as a function of experiencing the structure that its sentience has occupied. And so the multiverse is a, a compartmentalized volume of structured space that its sentience occupies. It's not all of it because it has to have a location for the rest of its sentience. But this multiverse is, is a compartmentalized volume of sentience that, it, that the source is occupying with its sentience. And that, that volume of, that, that's, that level of structured space encompasses three levels the lowest level which is frequency the next highest level which is sub subdimensional components which are part of the next highest level which are four dimensions and, and so the multiverse has has 12 full dimensions that that, that creates it and the, and the multiverse is, is, is a, uh, basically it's a it's a metric for our evolution, but it's also an environment for our evolution and progression. And uh, if I was to give you the structure as I understand it, and I'll tell you that later, in my understanding, I realise that, that, that structure just disappears, it just becomes formlessness or structurelessness, that we understand it as structure because of our low frequency existence here right now. We have to have something to help us to understand what's there. So there's 12 of these full dimensions. Which is interesting because it's also consistent with um, theoretical physicists. And Stephen Hawking said there's 11, 11 dimensions negating the one we're in now, <laughs> which is interesting because these dimensions all work in the same way apart from the first one. So I'll very quickly go over it. The second full dimension to the 12th full dimension, they all work in the same way. They all split out into three subdimensional components. And that each of those subdimensional components splits out into a frequency level or frequency band. And each of these frequency levels or frequency bands has the capability of and does support a self-contained, simultaneously manifest universal environment in its own right. So we have 11 times 3 times 12, which is 396 frequency levels or frequency bands, and therefore 396 universes. These are static. This is a static function. Parallel versions is something we, that's created as a function of our decisions process and, and a level of sentience within everything that's called event space, which allows duplications to be made. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. So the first full dimension is unique because it houses the lowest of the frequencies. So it behaves slightly differently. Although it splits out into three sub-dimensional components, it can collapses back into a composite sub-dimensional component, which only allows 12 frequencies to be created. And those 12 frequencies are so low that they're all required to create a universe. Think of it like the old days of having multiple floppy disks to load up a program onto your computer 
Whereas now you can put thousands upon thousands of those same files onto a, onto a small memory stick. It's, it's the finitude in the same space that, that counts. So we've got a unique situation. Where we've got one universe that has 12 frequencies to create it and one full dimension that's only got 12 frequencies and one universe. So the number of frequencies within the, within the multiverse is 12 plus 396, which is 408. There are only one plus 396 universes, making 397 universes. And we exist within this to help us experience, learn, and evolve. And an evolutionary cycle is us experiencing everything. All the environments within the multiverse, all the circumstances within the environments, and all the interactions that create circumstances within those environments because we're interacting with other entities who are also individualized units of sentience and experiencing learning and evolving as well. And so there we go. But the, this event space, though, is based upon it functions based upon sentience making a choice. So, for example, if I took a bus to go from one city to another city and I got out of that bus, I could turn left or right. So, yeah, what is this? How does this all relate to the multiverse? Well, the, the multiverse is, in essence, it's a an individualized or compartmentalized aspect of structured space that the the source our creator from to call that that we're individualized from um occupies with its sentience it it's it also has a, another level of uh, structure above that that it's its sentience occupies because it's it has to be somewhere else other than where where we are because it's compartmentalized part of its the structure that its sentience occupies so that it can use smaller individualized units of itself which are our higher self and therefore the higher self projects down smaller individualized units of itself which is the soul to experience the depths of the minute detail of of the the environments that are supported by this multiversal environment because it's got a number of a, a n number of different levels and a, a number of different universal environments associated with it as well and so it, and that's the, the that's because the multiverse itself has three of the levels of structure that that's, that the the sentience of the the source occupies. The lowest is the frequency. Then we go to subdimensional components, and then we go to full dimension. And there's twelve of these four dimensions that we that, that you know, we're occupying to experience, learn, and evolve through, you know, working with or experiencing. The, the environments and the circumstances that, to, that are created by the environments by the other uh, entities that are within those environments as well. So we, we collectively create circumstances and we work with the environment. But the the multiverse is, is created through 12 full dimensions, as I just said, um, which is interesting because the, the theoretical physicist and even Stephen Hawking said there was 11 full dimensions, but he negated the one that we're in there. So I'll, I'll explain the structure very, very, very quickly. There's 12 full dimensions. The first one is slightly different to the rest because it houses the lowest frequency. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But the second through to the 12th full dimension, they all behave exactly the same way. They have three subdimensional components and then they split out into the 12 frequency levels or frequency bands. And each of these frequency levels or frequency bands has the capability of and does support a self-contained simultaneously manifest universal environment in its own right. Now, these aren't parallel universes. This is a static structure. I'll talk about parallel universes in a moment because they're a function of something else which pervades everything called event space. And uh, event space basically functions like a duplicator but based upon the choices of sentience. So it works in conjunction with sentience. So we've got, in effect, within our multiversal environment that we exist within, there are 11 times 3 times 12, which is 396 frequency levels or frequency bands, and therefore universes. If we go down to the first full dimension, things are slightly different because it houses the lowest of the frequencies. So although it splits out into three subdimensional components, it collapses back into a composite subdimensional component because it's low frequency, all low frequencies. And... All these low frequencies are created, or I should say again, all these low frequencies are necessary 
to create a universal environment because they're all so low. So we have a, this unique situation where we have one universe occupying a whole full dimension. That universe needs 12 frequencies to create it. And therefore, it, there, there's only this one location which is you know got 12 frequencies because every other frequency every other frequency has a universe which has one frequency band and it's because of this this, this increase in finitude which increases by the power of 12 and if you think about it it's a little bit like you know having in the old days let's say 12 floppy disks to upload a program onto a computer whereas now with a, with a single memory stick we can store thousands upon thousands of the same size of file that previously occupied 12, 12 memory sticks it's all to do with finitude and what what is capable of being supported by the same space, but at the high levels of finitude. So if we go down back down to the, the multiversal environments, we have 12 frequencies added onto the 396, which is 408 frequencies, but only one extra universe, which is 397 universes. And the, the multiverse is there as a, a metric for our evolution because we need to experience all of it, but it's also a an environment for our evolution progression because we're experiencing the minute detail of what the source is on behalf of the source because its sentence is too big. So it's a bit like having my, you know, microscopic or nanoscopic volumes of sentience exploring the, the, the for instance, the, the pile on the carpet, the you know, little weeds on the carpet that we can't see that we could only see with an electron microscope. So we would be too big to observe those, and so the sentence is too big to observe the minute detail of its of, of, the, of the of the structure of space that it's occupying with this sentience. Whereas we, being very very minutely small in comparison, can experience learn evolve by getting right into the the nitty gritty of the the different environmental opportunities that the, the multiverse offers us in these different universes. So how how did you come across uh, this understanding or this knowledge? by accident <laughs> in effect um i was back in the early 2000s i was being taught by uh, one of barbara brennan's first generation students to do brennan healing science or be a be an energy healer and we had to basically open our chakras to move on to different frequency levels to affect healing on the different energy templates that are supported by the chakras that also create the overall volume of space that we call the human body we had to move up and down the frequencies i ended up going further than that quite by accident and the the, the students who we used to share healings with as part of the course used to say that they were being taken somewhere that they didn't recognize at all wasn't wasn't where anybody else in the class was, was taking them and they were being healed so so what's happening and um I eventually found out that I, the only way I could understand where I was going, because I was told to stay in the seven frequencies, I was, I was told off several times, actually, <laughs> quite quite sh quite sharply as well. The, the, only, the, the only thing I could do is to try to work a, a, a way of going to these different levels I was going to in a, in a robust and repeatable and logical manner. And I developed over the next five years or more various different ways of going to these different levels in in a robust way but it took ages i mean it took well over three quarters of an hour to start to go to a certain level uh very low levels it happened at the time i thought i thought it was quite high though um and then I'd, I'd have five or ten minutes there get the information off whichever entity was there and they would take me another three quarters of an hour to come back down the frequency and so eventually i, I developed a way of going up there much faster but I didn't quite understand the structure at the time, so I based it on 100. And I was allowed to do this, apparently, because I was going in the right direction, even though it was slightly it was, it was slightly at an angle. It was still, get, still going in the right direction, but at an angle. And it wasn't until I started to communicate with higher entities in, and those entities that existed within the higher, these higher frequencies within the, the multiverse, and therefore the higher universes within the multiverse, and including the source itself, but I started to recognise that there was a different that the structure that I was using wasn't right. It was just a, it was just something I was using. It was a structure I created to 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 enable me to move. So when I understood the structure properly, I could then move, and I understood where I was going. But I still didn't understand it until the second book, Beyond the Source, Book One, because I didn't. I knew there was something wrong with the first full dimension, 
but I, I just but I just couldn't put my finger on it. And it wasn't until later that I was told that you know, the first full dimension houses all the lowest frequencies. So it doesn't behave in the same way. So your thought about it being the same as the other full dimensions, um, or, or your thought about it not being exactly the same or, or showing a difference was absolutely right. But I couldn't see it until I'd absorbed the change from my initial structure of everything being based on 100 to having it being based upon what I thought was was 12 times 3 times 12 and not 11 times 3 times 12 and then 1 times 12. <laughs> it took a long time to get to understand it. And it, it even took a long time later to understand that there was more structure beyond that. And that was only because I started to get be, become connected to a, another larger entity that created our our source entity, our, our God, if you want to, by individualizing other volumes of its sentience. So you can start to see there's a structure of division of sentience from a hot, from the, the, the largest of these, of these entities that's called the origin, down through to the source entity, source entities, because there's more, there's more than one. There was 12 at that point in time. I've, I've since discovered there's more than that. Um, but that's, that's the, the book I'm writing now. Down to our higher selves or true energetic selves, but the Hindus call the Godhead. So it's, you know, the thought process is the same. It's just a different way of understanding it, right down to souls that are the smaller aspects of that sentence that are projected down into different locations within the multiverse to experience things in a sort of parallel way, but not in an event space way. Because event space is, as, as I've just alluded to, creates parallel versions of of our local environments, depending upon if we have a choice to make. So if we have a choice to make, it will cre create two of us and two localized versions or suburb versions or city versions or or continent versions or planet versions or solar system versions or or universe versions or even multiverse versions. So we have parallel versions of where we exist and we also have the static version, which is the start point, which everything converges back into eventually. Have you sensed these other parallel realities, uh, like a version of you that took a different road or made a different choice? Have you experienced or somehow sensed or glimpsed that? Not personally, although I do know people who um, ended up being my, my healing clients who were experiencing uncontrolled movement between two or three different realities. And that was creating very, you know, a very difficult environment for them because they were doing, they, they were convinced that they'd done something and they had done it, but in a different reality. And when they come back to this reality, they hadn't done it, but they'd done something else. And the, <laughs> and the people in this reality said, you know, we were there when you did it. Can't you remember it? And she said, no, I wasn't here. I was in such and such a location. So I've not experienced that myself, which would be very confusing and, and it can create significant psychological conditions because you start to just lose your anchor points. You know, with data and with where you are, it starts to disappear because you, you can't trust anything because you, f you feel you've done one thing, which you have, but there's no justification for it being in this environment or another environment that you're in <laughs> until you get there. So, so it's, it's, quite, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to, to be in the situation where you, know, you can be out of control that way. But having said that, I've experienced communicating with the origin in the book I'm working on now, which is called Beyond the Origin, which is actually beyond the origin's current levels of structured space with its volume of sentences occupying, into a state where all event spaces converge into one because they're all linked together. And therefore, therefore there isn't a past, present, or future. There isn't a linear existence. You know, event streams don't exist. Connection between different event spaces don't exist. So it's it's just everything is oneness, is nowness. And communicating with it when it is in both this version of the now <laughs> and other versions of the now has been really confusing because it talks about things being present when for me it's in the future <laughs> or it's in the, it's in my particular now or it's or it's in between those and so that's that's been very confusing for, for me although I'm, I'm just about dealing with it but it's actually being in that position myself where I'm going to these different versions of of, of my creation of a, of a reality. I've, I've not experienced that. 
and I don't want to because I, I, because it would stop me from focusing on being you know in here in this particular now dealing with what I'm dealing with now which is beneficial not only to me but to you know, the people who read my my books or 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 listen to the YouTube channel there's this movie from from the 90s with Gwyneth Paltrow uh, called Sliding Doors and she's experiencing these two different parallel realities or we're, we're watching as the observer as the uh, as the audience her two different realities unfold depending on whether she caught the train that one day or she missed the train that particular day and there's this one moment where it is a bleed over from one from one reality to another where she almost passes out while she's serving a uh, a, a family at a restaurant she's a, a waitress and in the other reality i think she had some sort of accident or she uh, practically died or something I, I forget the exact thing that happened in that other reality but the one version picked up on something trauma traumatic happening in the other reality and and she had to grab onto something before she fell over and, and so i'm just curious if is this bleed over something that common or uncommon and I don't know, yeah, there's there's uh this, this whole reality thing is quite uh discombobulating for for those who are trying to <laughs> figure out the the actual nature of reality it's uh it is all illusion so anyways what, well, what are your the, thoughts about that well <laughs> i was just about to say um in my book uh the curators there are a, a number of entities that that support the maintenance of the multiverse so that we can you know, evolve in the most efficient way. They they maintain the, the evolutionary efficiency of the multiverse. And they can basically manipulate event space. And so they can change event spaces. So we, we, logically speaking, we would go we would be experiencing event events in certain ways and we move from one event to another event. Um from our perspective it would be a linear progression and, and within those events is event streams. And so there are times when event spaces do co-join together and we get this this feeling of you know things are happening twice or things have happened before or you know deja vu those sorts of things but it does happen and we also get them when we we, we enter into locally high you know areas of locally high frequency where <clears throat> the structure of our particular now is based upon this frequency really in the first three frequencies which, which create the, the gross physical start to move into the next the next frequency which is the fourth frequency which is above where we are now we we, we can't see but you know individuals who've ascended to that level can see that level and they can see us see us as well and so there are times when we can for a moment see something else has happened and there's a wonderful book uh, i can't remember the author's name now but she's a those arc mountain publishers author uh, and she wrote a book called Twitters, and she called these events Twitters, where people suddenly find themselves in a completely different reality, you know, with bizarre visions that don't relate to where they are. And, and one was this, this: she reported the, a gentleman was walking through some part of New York, turned a corner, and all of a sudden he found himself in a a vast land covered in grass. And on this hill, he could see a, a, a red Indian on a horse. And he thought, well, where am I? And she interpreted that as being, he moved in you know, what we call time. And the time was just all over the place at that point because it's higher frequency because time doesn't exist. So you can move through all these events concurrently. And, you know, we talked about the, the, the real film where if you look at the, the individual frames of, of exposure you can see things separately but you start to run them at, at 60 frames a second you start to see them move but if you can imagine seeing all those frames in one at once so you see all the all the all the exposures on the on the on the the, the role of film not just the role of film but the, the, the cinema film at once you'd see all things that are classified as being time at once so everything's in the in the now and so for a moment, you know, this, this gentleman reported seeing 
what was obviously New York, but before before the white man got over there, before people, yeah, before the before the you know the, the settlers got there, yeah. and then he, he he just didn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. He, he, he thought it was strange. Now he would have be, he would have entered into a higher frequency, a higher frequency state himself, because he was already higher frequency. But the moment he started to doubt it, that lowers the frequency because you start to work with the ego mind rather than the the, the sentience mind. And so when he started to disbelieve it or, or or start to get worried or anxious, he would reduce his own frequency, and that would be enough to reduce the whole the overall frequency of where he was. And all of a sudden, he, he started to see New York again. So, mm. it, it, you know, it, they do sometimes merge, but it has to be in a location where the for the third frequency where we are now is locally high, and we enter into a, a point where a locally low area of the fourth frequency interacts with it, so we can then move between the two. What's the m- most astonishing vision or download that you've gotten? Most astonishing? Ooh. I don't know. There's been so many. <laughs> I suppose recently see, being given the opportunity to see nothingness and and being given a representation of, of it. Nothingness is the environment outside of structured space, which is actually an, an aberration because structured space was only created in nothingness as a function of the poten- of, of potential. Nothingness can be anything, so it's got potential. So it's a little bit like you know. A minus minus a minus equals a plus. <laughs> so it's it's this it's it's a it's it becomes an aberration, and this aberration created structured space where you know, event space became the, the dominant sentence, and then and, and then later the origin became the dominant sentence. But to see the origin just occupy the collective this collective sentence was was ever, ever, all sentience becoming one again rather than being individualized in different you know, different source entity different uh, godheads or trinity cells is that everything is back back into one one massive volume of of a high quality sentience with high quality evolution moving out of this structure into into this which was which was not even macroscopic in comparison to nothingness mm-hmm. and then because the sentience has moved out it no longer exists anymore because the, the potential is gone but the potential is moving to nothingness. And then, this, and then the origin realizing that it could recreate structured space in nothingness because it's, it, it is raw potential because it's raw sentience. And then doing it, and all these little bubbles of non-structured structured space starting to appear and starting to occupy nothingness. And then seeing the potential that nothingness could become somethingness, but it's structured space but without structure. And that's what the next evolutionary step is of the origin. Uh, beyond moving into the different levels of structure within structured space, was are humans allowed to see that? <laughs> it's you know maybe it's part of our learning that we should understand where we are and understand that we are truly part of something amazing, and that this something amazing has already happened. Because everything has converged into one, but right now, because we're in a low frequency, we're having to experience things one frame at a time. And that's that's the, that's the most in- amazing uh, experience I've had. Mm. That, that's that's a recent one. And were you on a plant medicine journey, or you're just uh, uh, taking a nap, or what? How did how did this occur? Basically, I don't take any 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 drugs, any of this sort of stuff. It's pure meditation, uh, and that's the way forwards. We we use things like you know computers, phones, televisions to communicate with each other and and do all the things that we can do naturally. Should we realise what we are, we don't need to have anything. We can just communicate instantaneously through telepathy. Should we give ourselves the opportunity to do so? Although initially, all those years ago, it took me a long time to get to these levels, even the, even the lowest levels, it took me a long, long time. I've now developed the technique so I can just go there. 
it's not even a mental switch. It's a, it, uh, I've only got to have the desire and I'm there. So when I'm writing the books, I'm sitting down at my computer and I'm back where I was previously with the with the origin or the source or any other entities. And I'm and I'm there. And I'm I'm both here and there. So I'm sort of my sentence is in two locations. Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, I've, I've with with the advanced version of the of this correspondence course I call traversing the frequencies, where I teach people to do as I do. I teach them to be in more than one location at once, three or four locations at once sometimes, depending upon the quality of the students. So we can be uh, split our sentencing against these different levels whilst still being here. And that's basically what I do when I'm communicating with the source. I'm in different locations concurrently to be able to, and I type it straight in. As it happens, I'm typing it straight into the computer. So I said, I've got enough sentence here to type into the computer while the rest is experiencing different things with the within the within the multiverse or, or beyond the multiverse do you have experiences where your body gets taken over by uh by source by uh entities that then kind of control your your vocal cords and your typing and everything or you're always still present in that instance i'm always still present i have enough of my sort of sentience in my body still to be able to work the body, animate the body. But when I do uh, readings for people, uh, and sometimes healings, there are times when their guide and helpers come through, and they will move my sentence out, you know, out of the way, and animate the body, and, and not just move the body, but they'll also communicate directly with these, with these, with these people who want to experience some level of information about themselves that they can't get themselves you know they have to use somebody who's a medium or something or a channel or something so yes i mean and the source does does animate you know, on a rare occasion the source does animate the body as well it tends to speak in the singular because we're part of it so from our perspective it's, it's one whereas from the perspective of the guide and the helpers there's lot there's one guy but lots of helpers helping us navigate through our incarnation so they tend to speak collectively and therefore speak um speak you know in, in the plural so to speak so that happens generally when i'm being you know from being a reader for people uh or, or or doing healing for people rather than actually doing the, you know my own investigative work writing the books do you ever do that on podcasts where you uh you channel or uh you you convey information directly from other entities or from source there are times when I do the World Sat Sangha where, with some of the questions that come through, because I do um, a pre recorded lecture and then a pre recorded meditation, and then I do the questions and answers live on, on Zoom. There are times when some of the questions rec- um, are beyond my current knowledge base. And so, therefore, if I have the time or, 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 or get the inclination, I do on the spot channeling to 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 get the information relative to the answer to that particular question. So so yes, but it's not it's not something I intentionally do. It's something that happens when it's supposed to happen. So like sometimes when you're getting interviewed, do you ever get n- nudged like, hey, uh, <laughs> here's something you need to convey to the 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 audience or to the person you're you're being interviewed by? If it's something personal, I, I don't. I don't get that in that in that environment. It's usually if it's in the environment where you know it's it's a one to one discussion or or an, or or an appointment that they're having with me, but for a reading or a healing. And to, and to be honest, I, I I would shy away from that because when we're getting personal information about somebody, it's it's theirs. You know, it's their private information, and so to share it with somebody else in a in a, in a public arena is, is not is not the professional way to do it. To be honest. Yeah. So, so, so I'll move. So I don't, I don't think you know, engage, engage in that or or encourage that to be either. But mm-hmm. if it's general information, then that then that can come through as channel information during the questions and answers session. Yes, interesting. And uh, when you're channeling or or connecting with uh, with the higher frequencies and dimensions, are are you also communicating with uh aliens or is it uh mostly 
uh, angels or uh, ascended masters or other kinds of beings, or it's just source consciousness or like what, uh, where, where, where do aliens and, and uh, angels and all that fit into this? Well, what we call angels are, are in my understanding, which, which may be superseded by somebody else because we're all sort of stepping stones on the, on the, on the evolutionary block. Angels, in my understanding, are, are basically what I call curators. They're the different entities that are maintaining the evolutionary efficiency of the multiverse. Then there's another group of entities that are um, helping us because we're in the evolutionary cycle, but they're in the service side of things. So they help us while we're incarnate and while we're, while we're almost totally disconnected from who and what we are. They Sometimes people classify them as their guardian angels, but they're basically the, you know, a guide and a group of entities who are quite close to us and who you know, give us the nudge um, to do certain things at certain times in certain locations with certain people. And, you know, it, it, we get in, you know, in, intuitive thought processes or intuitive desires to, to do certain things. I only communicate with those individuals, those those gu those those the guide and helpers, where I'm communicating with them to assist in getting information about something they want to find out about in the reading, for example. Normally, when I'm getting information, it's direct to source or it's direct to a group of entities called the Arm, which I'm supposed to be part of. I'll say supposed to be because um, it would be ego egotistical to say I am, but. but a number of individuals over the years have, have indicated that I'm part of this other group, which is not part of the source. It's a it's a, another group of entities that are created almost by mistake. <laughs> They're the uncreated creations in, in one, 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 my, late, my latest book I've, I've got published, and they exist outside of the multiverse. In fact, outside of the all the source entities um, volumes of structure of of, of the of the origin that, that their sentence occupies. That's probably why I can go outside the multiverse. Um, so I communicate with the arm, and, and and I do communicate with some some aliens. Um, and, I, and I I don't like use, using the word alien because it, it means that they're different. But actually, all they are is is they're the same soul genre as, as us, but they're incarnating a different body in a different location within the the galaxy or another galaxy within the or different frequency within the universe. So they are simply. And then, and then, you know, we might be incarnate in that that body type in our next incarnation. You know, we we don't just incarnate on, in the human body; we incarnate in all sorts of different form factors, in different frequencies, in different locations within the physical universe. So, you know, think of it. Think of a of a body type, and it, it'll, it'll exist out there somewhere. Certainly within the gross physical, and definitely within these the, the spiritual physical levels, which are. More and more finer, or more and more energetic, but still, still classified as incarnation, as it is. But yeah, but the entities I communicate with tend to, that are alien, <laughs> with the call it that, tend to be ones I've created a sort of a link with, and they exist in a on a location on the mountain in a place called uh, Voulish Bene, um in Crete, <clears throat> not too far from where. Where my late wife and I bought a, a, an old creature and cottage that we rebuilt, and they made his house on the roof there. And I noticed I was being watched one day. I thought, where, where are these? Yeah, where are these eyes coming from? And there was a, I noticed there was an alien base on a, on a hillside across the valley from where I was, and I noticed, yeah, their, their vehicles coming and going in the next frequency up from where we are now. And started to communicate with them. And they, they've given me some information as well, which is part of the first book, the, the History of God. Um, I don't tend to communicate with them to get information, because I tend to stick with the higher, the higher, higher information from the source or from the origin or, or from the arm. And sometimes from my late wife Anne, who communicated with me to create the book, The End Dialogues, which is all about the all about the inc incarnation process and <clears throat> more depth and detail about who and what we are, but using common subject headings that we can all understand. To be to be honest, I, I sort of very, I feel very picky and choosy as to where they go. <laughs> I like to go, I like to go to the top because that's where you get the best information from. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I used to communicate mostly with angels, and then I, uh, I don't know, I came to the realization, or I was given the realization that I can and would be best served 
by going directly to God and uh, developing that relationship, uh, that personal relationship with God. So I do that now. Most of my conversation is is with God. So I know we're we're, uh, we're we're getting close to time here. So what would be something that you would want our listener to be left with that would maybe uh, be the next step up the ladder for for them wherever they are? Like, what's the next door for them to open or the next rung on the ladder? Ladder. How do they gain access to that? Meditate. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I get interviewed, I say meditate, 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 and be of service to others, and recognize that, in essence, we're all part of the same source. They're all part of the same volume of sentience, and therefore we're all we're all one. I am you. You are me. We are all source. The, the person down the road is us. When we start to understand that, we we won't start to be angry at each other or we won't start to you know discriminate against each other we'll start to realize that we're all one and the same thing and that if we are discriminating against some somebody else who's in, or another soul that's incarnate we're only affecting ourselves so why why would you beat yourself up I mean, you wouldn't so the, the whole thing is that you know if you can meditate you know do a, a regime of meditation start with five minutes a day then 10 minutes then 20 minutes you know once or twice a day and then build up and build up and build up and also, you know, see the beauty in, in everybody else because everybody else is here on Earth, which is a very difficult location to be with individualized free will to accelerate their own evolution and therefore accelerate the evolution of their higher self and therefore accelerate the evolution of source. So we're all struggling here. It's all hard work. You know, in real terms, it's like being underwater, <laughs> whereas normally we can fly in space. That's the difference between, well, it's actually a greater difference, actually. But it's the difference between what, you know, what we normally are and, and what we're experiencing here. It's, it's so difficult to be here. But just recognize that we're all struggling to navigate through our, our incarnation and, and do the best we can. So why wouldn't we help each other if we, if we recognize that we're all part of the same sentience, we're all one? So that's the thing to do is just help each other, be of service to each other, meditate, you know, open your chakras if you can do if you go onto my website www.beyondthesource.org find the press pack go down to the press pack you'll see chakra opening exercises download them they're free that allows you to open your chakras more than they are now and will help raise your frequencies and it will also augment your um, your meditation as well so meditate 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 be of service realize that we're all one and just help each other that's that's the that's the that's the way to glory without doubt. That's the way to the the pinnacle and the, and the way to kickstart the Aquarian age. Wonderful. And so your website again is beyondthesource.org. Correct. Yeah. So so on the website you can see everything about me, where all the all the blogs I've done, um, <clears throat> all the world sat sangers that, that are there. Uh, there's three World Satsanga books just come out now, the lectures and two questions and answers books. They're, they're quite meaty books because there's over 10 years worth of World Satsangas there. But everything that's been asked has been asked in those books. Um, so there's the, the different books I'm writing, what I'm working on now, the latest news, you know, the things you can download, all all the PDF. So everything about what I'm doing is on the website, www.beyondthesource.org. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Guy. And thank you, listener, for being open-minded and uh, considering what uh, might be you know, uh, a, a, a little discombobulating for you. <laughs> we'll catch you in the next episode. <laughs> I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.